All right, turn your Bible to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, you want to pick up last week where we left off. This is the, the, the title of the message here is A Call to Be Steadfast. We talked about that. We're going to try to deal with this for the next several weeks. And in Psalm 78, we have the generation you do not want to imitate. You, this is a generation that is not steadfast, and we, we just want to take a quick look at it. Read with me again in verse, from verses 5 and down Psalm 78, verse 5. He, he decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God. That's what he was after. And would keep his commands, those two things. And they would not be like their forefathers, the stubborn and rebellious generation, that set not their hearts aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. And then as someone pointed out last week to me that if I would have gone on and, and read and read the next verse, it would indicate one of the ways that they manifested this was here it says, The many men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. You see, it's usually in the intensity of spiritual warfare, trial and testing, that we discover whose hearts have not been set aright and whose spirits are not steadfast with God. Because if we can't handle the conflict, things get heated up, things get intense. Well, we tend to shrink back quick. I don't know how many people love a conflict. If you're one of those that just love a conflict, you're kind of in the exception. No one likes a conflict. No one likes it intense. And when, when a minister or someone else wants to deal intensely with sin, or when, there's a, when there is spiritual warfare going on and severe trial testing, we, do, we sometimes find out not everyone is comfortable with that. Certainly the men of Ephraim weren't. They turned back in the heat of battle. What happens if we shrink back? What does it say in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35? But we are not of those who shrink back, because if we shrink back, what happens does it say? God's not pleased with those who shrink back. I'll read it for you. You don't need to turn there, because we're not going to spend any time there, but just let me read that, that for you. It says, Remember those earlier days when you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. See, a person whose heart has been set aright and whose spirit is steadfast, they stand their ground even in the face of great suffering. It says, Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution, but you still stood your ground. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your goods. The King James says the spoiling of your goods. That'd be great. That means if someone came and forcibly took everything you had, what would you be doing? Praise God. The hallelujah, you know. I remember one time I was staying with a guy in Arkansas. He was living there because he wanted to be safe. He had no electricity and no running water other than one of these natural pumps that worked off pressure. It was a little it was an interesting gadget. But he had no electricity. He was living up there to be safe. And he was telling me, he was asking me if I realized that the Chinese army was amassing south of the, of the Texas border there on, on the northern end of Mexico. And I said, no. Would you be, if, you sure get a, if you get a definite date and where they are, let me know so I can be one of the first to greet them. And he didn't like that at all because I did, I, I'm not afraid of the Chinese army. I'm not afraid of the Russian army. You know, the only thing they can do to me is send me to heaven early. You, you, in the face of suffering, if you have confidence towards God... You don't shrink back. It goes on to say here, because it says, You knew you, you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Why should I fight over something I can't keep anyway? can't take my life. You can't take my eternal soul. That's the only thing I can keep. And, and since they can't touch that, I have, we have no reason to fear. And he goes on to say, So don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive just what he had promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. 
And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. And it goes on to say that we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. So if we shrink back, we'll be destroyed. And if we shrink back, God will take no pleasure in us. You know what it says in Proverbs 10.35? There's this verse. If you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? If you falter in times of struggle or trouble, how small is your strength? You see, let me, let me, let me explain this. Acknowledging that we are weak in our natural selves is not a full confession of faith. You're not confessing the truth when you say we are weak in our natural selves because that's only a partial truth. A full confession of faith is one who says they are weak but hmm, he is strong. See, even the children know this. We really, and David Berg has pointed out, we really should be singing we are weak but he is strong. So full confession of faith is saying I may be weak but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a full confession of faith. Not just admitting you're weak. We are weak, but Christ strengthens me in my weakness. That's a real confession of faith. As a matter of fact, did you know that um, weakness by faith is turned to strength? Turn to Hebrews chapter 11, if you will. Hebrews chapter 11. Our weakness is supposed to be turned to strength. It was here for these in Hebrews chapter 11. Once you find chapter 11 of Hebrews, then find verse 34. And this is describing some of those men in the first covenant who lived by faith and were, and were found pleasing to God. We'll start verse 32 because it's just kind of difficult to jump right in the middle of a verse. And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, and whose weakness was what? Turned to strength. You see, the full confession of faith is God has turned my weakness into His strength. God has turned my weakness into His strength because we are commanded as Christians to be strong. Turn to Ephesians. If you have your New Testament, if you're still in the New Testament, turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to be reading from verse 10 to verse 13. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Now, who's this written to? This is written to Christians. So, let me... Everybody here, if you wouldn't mind, look at me. I want to tell you something. Be strong. Be strong. Don't go around confessing how weak you are. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We're called to be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers and authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand. And after you have done everything to stand, stand therefore. How about that? A full confession of faith is not simply acknowledging what we are presently. It's acknowledging what we are to be. It's not what you are. It's what you are to be that God expects of us. You are weak, and God expects every one of us to be strong. Be strong. Having done everything to stand, stand. Put on the full armor of God. Take your stand against the devil and don't shrink back. That's what we're called to do. And that's what the Lord expects of us. Paul said this, and I'll just read a couple of verses for you. 
You don't need to turn there. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, it says this. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. I like the way the King James says this. It says, watch, stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men. Be strong. What do you, what do you think that means? Quit ye like men. Stop acting like you're just a man. Stop acting like all you have is natural power available to you. Is God with you or not? Is the very author of life himself in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit dwelling in you? If he is dwelling in you, quit acting like mere men. And act like a spirit-filled child of God. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the power of His might. Be steadfast. In another place it says, Paul told Timothy, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Turn with me to Romans. Let's look at Abraham. How did he do this? How are you strong? How can we do this? How can you just be strong? How do you do this? This is what we're commanded to be. How do you do this? How did Abraham do it in chapter 4 of Romans? Look with me. Find verse 18. And let's read from 18 and 20 and see how Abraham did it. Because he had to do it against all hope. In verse 18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be, without weakening, where? In his faith. Okay, now follow this. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened. And strengthened where? In his faith. See, without weakening in his faith, he was strengthened in the faith. And gave glory to God, being fully persuaded God had power to do what He has promised. And that's why it was credited to Him as righteousness. Do you and I want the righteousness of God to be credited to us? Then you had better not be weak in your faith. You better be strengthened in your faith. You had better be strong in the faith. You better be strong in the grace that's in, the Lord, in, in Christ Jesus. And you had better not shrink back in adversity. Because if you shrink back, the Lord shall take no pleasure in you. It is a day for Christians to be strong in their faith. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the power of His might. And, and this will create that heart that is set aright. And a spirit that is steadfast with God. And then we won't be like that other generation. Now it's interesting. Turn with me to the book of Joshua. And look at the Lord's commands to Joshua. He was, he was about to have to lead the nation of Israel into the land of milk and honey. There was just a few things they had to do first. They had to destroy nations that were larger, stronger, bigger, more powerful, better equipped than they did. They were living in high-walled cities that had been there for years. That's all they had to do first. So in order to prepare him for this mission, here in Joshua, the first chapter of Joshua... Joshua is given a charge. Moses is speaking to him, but he's giving him direction straight from the Lord. And he tells him in verse 5 of Joshua chapter 1, No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or the left. That you may be successful wherever you go. Don't let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong. Be courageous, do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. 
What is the one thing Joshua was told three times in this passage? Be strong and be courageous. Be strong and be courageous. You know, you know what discouragement is? What is discouragement? What does it mean to be discouraged? Thank you. What business does a Christian have being discouraged? That's not something we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be men and women of courage. Don't give in to discouragement. That's not for us. The world has their reasons to be discouraged. Let North Korea develop nuclear weapons. What is that to us? We don't have to be discouraged by that. We don't have to be dis discouraged by the Chinese economy. The fact that we are now $50 billion a year in trade deficit, annual trade deficit, to them, does it matter? What is there on earth enough to discourage a person with God with them? We have no reason to be discouraged. We need to be strong. Many people excuse their actions by simply saying, well, you, you have to understand, I, I'm discouraged. What have they just said? Why don't they say, you just have to understand, I'm not believing. I'm just, I'm just in unbelief right now. You'll just have to excuse me because I don't have any faith today. Because that's what you're saying. God is not, is God with you still? Has He promised to never leave you nor forsake you? Has He promised to provide all the grace you could ever need? Sure, then, then let's call discouragement what it is. Unbelief. Lack of courage. Lack of being strong. We must not be weakened in our faith. We must be strengthened in the faith in order to give glory to God. That's what we must be. We must be strong in the Lord in the power of His might. You know, we've forgotten the words to Jesus Christ that He, uh, the words of Jesus Christ that He said to His disciples. He was getting ready to be crucified, and they weren't quite sure of what was going on. And then He was telling them that He was going to be going away, and He told them something about their hearts. He said, let not your heart be... No, not hard. That's, a, that's true. That's true. Both, everyone, let not your heart be troubled. Hey, is there anybody, is there tr is anybody troubled? Why? We're, we're, told, we're told, let not your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, he said, believe also in me. So what's the key to not having a troubled heart? Believe. Believe. Be strong in the faith. Don't be weakened in the faith. Be strengthened in your faith. Give glory to God. God has power to do what He's promised. Against all hope. Be like Abraham. In hope. Believe. Don't stagger at the promise of God. Be strengthened in your faith. Be steadfast. Now here, turn back with me to Psalm 78 because I want you to see this. The reason the Israelites had not set their heart aright and that their spirits weren't steadfast with God is expressed here. And I didn't read this last week and I want to come back to it before we go on to the solution of this matter. Because it's, we're not going to stay on just the problem. We want to go to the solution. But we need to see it in them first. In Psalm 78... We see that the reason the Israelites had not set their hearts aright and their spirits were not steadfast towards God is that despite all of His miracles, and it was wonderful, Sunday school went such along with this, what were the real purpose of miracles? To get the people to do what? To believe. Okay, so despite all the miracles that God did for Israel, in spite of all that, what did they not do? They didn't come to believe. They did not come to a strong faith. Look here in Psalm 78. Look with me in verse 22. For they did not believe in God or trust in His deliverance. And look down with me in verse 32. In spite of all this, 
in spite of the fact that it said in verse 25, they ate the bread of men and of angels, despite the fact that he rained down meat, uh, meat upon them from the middle of nowhere, it says they ate till they had more than enough. Despite all of this, it says they kept on sinning in spite of his wonders they did not believe. And this is what the grace of God, the power of God, and the goodness of God is to lead us to do. God is wanting us to be lead. So, can we do this? And I like this word, because if you be lead, you will be alive. If you be lead, you will be living. Be strong, be faithful, be courageous, be believing. Don't, don't be discouraged. Don't be troubled. Don't be unbelieving because that's what this generation was and what happened to them. You know what God's final verdict to them of this generation was? On the very border of the promised land. I mean, they are standing one little river. The Jordan River is separating them from the land of milk and honey. They've already defeated the nation of, Og of King, King Og of Bashan and King Sihon of the Amorites. They've already defeated two, whole, two nations. And, and part of Israel has already had their inheritance. Despite this, they are not going to believe God fully. Uh, this is later. I'm going to take that back. That happens a little bit later. But they're standing on the verge of, they're standing on the verge of uh, crossing into the, the promised land. They send 12 spies out. This is, the, this is the time they send the 12 spies out. Ten of the spies come back and give a very accurate report of the land. There are large cities, large people, very strong, very powerful, and more numerous than all of us. Very accurate report. And what does that report do to the people? It, dis it discourages them. They lose their courage. And this is God's reaction to it. You don't need to turn there, but listen to God's, God's response to them. Here's what he tells to Moses. Then he says, the whole assembly talked about actually stoning Moses and Caleb and Joshua because they were trying to, to encourage the people who had become discouraged by the report. It says, the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to all the Israelites. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me despite all the miraculous signs I've shown them? So you know what he said he'll do? He said, this is what he says, and this is in Psalm 78 if you're still there. It says in verse 33, in spite, after the verse where it says, in spite of all his wonders they did not believe, it says, so he ended their days in futility. Their years in terror. Now, can I describe how that is? How, how, what it means that he ended it, their days in futility? They were led for 40 years, fed for 40 years, but dead in the wilderness outside the land of promise. Led, fed, but dead. You see the futility of that? What was 40 more years for? They just died. Just, just so they could wander the wilderness and die. Because they did not believe God. He ended their days in futility. Leading them around the wilderness till the last of them died. Now, this is the real danger of not having a heart that's been set aright and a spirit that's been steadfast. When God takes no pleasure in a people, it is because they have refused to come to a mature faith towards Him despite all that He has done to enable them to believe. This is my concern for all of us. We must become a people who refuse to become discouraged. We must become, be a people like Abraham who are strengthened in our faith and not weakened in our faith. We must become a people who refuse to shrink back. We must become a people who put on the full armor of God and having done all to stand. This is my primary calling as an elder pastor. This is the primary calling. It is to strengthen the saints. It's to see that faith is developed, is matured. Turn with me and you'll see this in Ephesians chapter 4. This is the primary mission. It's not preaching funerals. That's a part of it. It's not marrying people. That's a part of it. But judges can do that. 
You don't even need a minister to do that. Although I believe in Christian marriage and it should be done in the name of Christ. Look in Ephesians 4. This is the primary mission of pastor teachers. Look in verse 11 of chapter 4. It says, it was he who gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become what? Mature. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every kind of wind. You see, that's we need to come to full maturity as believers. Um, turn with me real quick to First Peter, and let me illustrate this by a verse in First Peter. First Peter chapter two. Look in the second verse of chapter 2, 1 Peter 2, 2. Like newborn babes crave the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. I looked at this uh, interesting phrase in the Greek and it is that you may grow ice soterion. You may grow unto salvation. We need to grow in salvation. We need to grow in salvation. And growing in salvation is going to be achieved by growing in faith. For example, 2 Peter, you're right near there, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. And and we're going to read verses 5 and on in a minute. But you see, it's very important for our faith to be developed. Strengthened, enhanced, enlarged. Until it becomes mature and productive. Christ must be more than just the author of our faith. I don't doubt right here in this room that Christ for most of you is the author of your faith. But he cannot merely be the author. Christ needs to be the finisher. He needs to finish what he has begun. And he wants to finish what he's begun. And part of how he's done that is he's given ministers to equip the people until they become mature. No longer infants tossed to and through until they become stable, steadfast, strong, encouraged people putting on the armor of God. People that stand their ground and don't shrink back. (laughs) And part of this is achieved by reminding the people, like Peter did, To do this, look in 2 Peter chapter 1. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness or virtue, knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will not never fall. Isn't that wonderful? I want all of us to enjoy the security of never worrying about falling. But the only way that I can give you genuine security about not falling is to bring you into the place where you are diligently and daily adding to your faith virtue and knowledge and and self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love. If these things are in you and abounding, you will be very secure. You won't fall. You'll be steadfast. You won't shrink back. But only under these conditions. Because it says if you don't have them, you you become unproductive. 
and blind and nearsighted. Now, a true spiritual shepherd, think about this. Here's Peter as a shepherd. A true spiritual shepherd is not content to merely know you're a sheep. Is he? Do y'all want me to just to be content to say, well, come on, Mother Al, I'm a sheep. Isn't that enough? Is that enough? No, go ahead. It's not enough. No, it's not. A, a true spiritual shepherd, here's what the scripture says, be sure to know the what of your flocks? Condition. A true spiritual shepherd is not satisfied to for a person to say, I'm a sheep, what kind of condition is the sheep in? Are they in their maximum potential? I mean, Kenny, Kenny's a worry wart. He's got cows that are good enough. He, he do not think pond water is good enough. He wants to give them well water. What a worry wart. He ought to just be happy. He's got cattle and be satisfied with it. He's got some pasture. Why isn't that enough? Why is he always trying to achieve excellency as their condition? Because that's when you get the highest productivity, the best growth. It's not enough to be a Christian. It's not enough to be a sheep. My concern is to bring us into productivity, maturity, and excellence as Christians. So we come to what the scripture calls perfect. Now, this is best seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 40. Turn, turn there and... I'll try to wrap this up in the next few minutes. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. What I'm talking about is the biblical word that our translators translate perfect. Be perfect. You'll see this, it, but here, the Greek word is uh, teleos, and it's found here. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, look with me. It says this. Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regards to evil, be infants. But in your thinking, be adults. That's how it says it in the NIV. I want to read it to you from the, the uh, New King James in my Greek interlinear New Testament. I have it here. And I, and I have some notes I want to read straight out of here. So that you, you can see these are not just my ideas, but the Greek scholars' ideas with me. Here's what it says in the New King James. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. Here's the, here's the Greek word teleos and their comments about it. They say teleos is a frequent adjective meaning complete, perfect, mature, full-grown. It's derived from the noun telos, which means end or goal. And so the basic meaning is to reach the end designed for. What end were we designed for? We were designed not to just be born again a babe, God designed us to not just stay a babe, but to what? To grow up into a mature son or daughter. That's the end we were designed for. And so that's part of my job, is to bring us as a congregation. And, and that's our job with one another, to encourage one another to let Christ finish our faith. Let, us, let Him bring us to the end, to where complete mature, entire. Isn't that what James says in James 1? My brothers, count it all joy whenever you face trial of various kind. For patience must have her what? Perfect work. That she may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So I do desire a level of maturity and consistency and stability and steadfastness in us all that I know is pleasing and bring glory to God. And and along this line, I've been asking, Lord, what, what's the key ingredient to this? You know, in, in, a, in a recipe, you'll have a main ingredient. You'll have many ingredients, but one will be principal. One will be the foundation of the product you're making. And I've, had, I've, I've been asking the Lord for stability, for this process, Lord, for 
for, for Christians coming to maturity and completeness, what is the foundational element that's necessary? And this is a verse that, I, that gave me a great um, hint at what it is. Turn with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. And find verses 12 through 14. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do, but above all these, put on love, which is the bond of what? It says it's interesting, it's the bond of unity, but in the Greek, it is the same word for perfect. Love is the bond of perfection. So now follow me. Here's what Paul's saying. It's important to have tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance with one another, forgiveness towards one another, forgiving uh, any complaint. It, those are important. But the only way to bind all of these together in a complete and a mature way is in love. That's, it. That's the only way we can really come to the full comprehension of the maturity that God wants us is to be able to comprehend the love of God. Now, can you see what happened to the Israelites? Despite mercy upon mercy, despite miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle, what was it that they really had a problem with? What was it that they really never came to grips with that they couldn't really believe? What was it? They really couldn't believe that God loved them. They really couldn't believe that God loved them. And you know what? If we are troubled, if we are not steadfast, if we become easily discouraged, you know why? Because you don't know how much God loves you. You just haven't come to realize how much God loves you. His love is not like ours. Ours is like the morning mist that disappears pretty quickly when it gets hot. God's love is not like that. Just trying to wrap this up. Look with me in the same book, Ephesians. Uh, the next book, or actually we were in Colossians. Two books earlier, Ephesians. I just had already turned there. Ephesians chapter 3. This is, a, this is going to be a pretty clear answer on the key element, the key ingredient in coming to spiritual maturity. Look with me in verse 14 of Ephesians 3. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom His whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in what? It's very critical. That's where we must be rooted and established. That we, being rooted and established in love, may have power to gra together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge in order that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now what would being filled to the measure of all the fullness of God mean? Maturity. That's the end. That's getting there. So what is the key to getting there? Being enabled by God's Spirit at work in you to grasp just how much He loves you. You know, young people, guys like Jeremy and, and Tiger and Dylan and Jonathan, let me tell you something. 
The world don't love you. The world don't love you. And it wants nothing from you but your money. God loves you. God wants nothing for you but your but his very best. Don't let Satan rob you. The, the thief, that the God of this world, Jesus said the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. He's not here to give you anything. He's here to get from you. He's a con man. And if you really come to understand the love of Christ, you begin to see God as a rewarder of those that seek Him. God gives His best to all who seek Him. The Bible says the Lord withholds no good thing from him who walks uprightly. The Lord withholds no good thing from him who walks uprightly. And if you if you believe in the love of God, you'll seek him. You'll seek him. It's in, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about next week about uh, those things that hinder our ability to really comprehend the love of God for us. Because this is a this is a spiritual comprehension. And I don't want to cover it tonight, or today, this morning. But I want to read this song to you. Most people know, are familiar with the name John Newton. It, he wrote a very famous hymn. Might, can anybody name it? Amazing Grace. That's right. Thank you, Dave. John Newton... Uh, John Newton wrote Amazing Grace, but he wrote another song that is that's actually a little bit more of my favorite because it speaks to this the importance of our seeing clearly how much God loves us and how it affects our daily life. And it's called the name of this the name of the hymn is How Tedious and Tasteless the Hours. And, it's, and I don't think many of you have sung it many times in church. <laughs> But uh, I've heard it sang by a, uh, a young lady. I don't remember the, her name, but it, and, uh, and it was popular in the 70s, actually, in Christian radio. Listen to this. How tedious and tasteless the hours when Jesus no longer I see. Sweet prospects, sweet birds, and flowers have all lost their sweetness to me. The midsummer sun shines but dim. The fields strive in vain to look gay. But when I am happy in Him, December is as pleasant as May. His name yields the richest perfume, and sweeter than music His voice. His presence disperses my gloom and makes all within me rejoice. I should... Were he always thus nigh, had nothing to wish or to fear, no mortal so happy as I, my summer would last all the year. Content with beholding his face, my all to his pleasure resigned, no changes of season or place would make any change in my mind. While blessed with a sense of his love, a palace, just a toy, would appear. And prisons would palaces prove if Jesus would dwell with me there. He, then he asks, he finishes his song with, Dear Lord, if I truly am thine, if thou art my son and my song, then why do I languish and pine? And why are my winters so long? Oh, drive these dark clouds from my sky. Thy soul-cheering presence restore. Or take me to thee on high, where winter and clouds are no more. When we really are beholding his face, if our all to his pleasure is resigned, no changes of season or place would make any change in our mind. We'd be steadfast. We would not ever be discouraged. And part of, I want you to understand, part of the ministry of the Word of God is so that faith can come by hearing. See, I don't want you to feel condemned 
if this has not been your experience, if this has not been your experience, it's because of the weakness of your faith. Our ministry to one another is to encourage one another in the faith. To believe this life of joy and peace and steadfastness, of maturity and godliness and righteousness, is not only possible, it's the only acceptable norm. If we've not been there, it's because we've been poorly taught. It's because we have been weak in faith. It's time for us to become mature. To let Christ finish us. To make us strong and steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Having done all to stand. That's all I have time for this morning. We're out of time. But next week and in the weeks to come, I want to talk. We are really going to dwell on something probably you guys have longed for me to dwell on. Is the love of God. Because I'm convinced. That when we are discouraged, when we become unsettled, when we, when we allow ourselves to react, it's because we have not yet really comprehended the great love of God. We just don't know. We've heard it. Maybe we've heard about it all our life. But hearing about something and, and, and knowing it personally is different. How many of you know our president? Okay, no, you know who he is. You met him? I know who he is. I'm from Texas. No, I don't know. Never met him. You can know, you can have heard about the love of God all your life and not know it. It takes, and we'll find out more of this next week. We're going to spend some more time in Ephesians. It takes being strengthened with power by the Holy Spirit in the inner man to even be able to grasp this. It's not natural. I mean, how could Christians, the early Christians, be convinced that God loved them when they were being mauled by lions? Burned at the stake. Crucified upside down. Ripped apart by two trees being tied together and let go. All these things they did without weakening in their faith. It's possible. And it's possible for the weak to become strong. So if you feel weak, this is not going to be a season of condemnation for the weak. This is going to be a season when the Word of God and the ministers of God are going to stand up here and say, Now, let the weak say, Now, let the weak say, you got it? Now. You say, how do you say that? By faith. You say that by faith. You say that I am weak, but He is strong in me. I can do all things. It doesn't say I will be able to do all things. It says I can. You can be steadfast. You can be an overcomer. You can come to maturity. You can. I believe everybody here can. I believe everybody here should. I believe everybody here better. <laughs> That's good. Father, if we, if we have been, any of us, to any degree that we have been, weak too long, we want to come to the full confession and be just as convinced of how strong you are in us. And for your own namesake, so that you can be recognized by our neighbors, by our friends, by our fellow, fellow family members, so that they can see your grace at work in us. We want to be finished. We want you to continue to work to be the finisher of our faith. We want to be strengthened. We want to be changed from one degree of glory into another. We want to go from strength to strength. We want to see that we are not, we're not the same because you have changed us and are changing us. So I'm asking you now, Father, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm assuming right now that many brothers and sisters here along with me, we can humble ourselves and we can acknowledge 
that when we have been unsettled, when we have been discouraged, when we have been troubled, when we have faltered, the truth of the matter is we were very weak in faith. And we cry out to you like the father of that young boy. Lord, we believe. Help thou our unbelief. Strengthen us. Bring us to that place. Bring us to the finishing place. Be the finisher of our faith. Bring us to maturity. Make us strong, Lord. Make us steadfast, Lord. Make us stable for your own name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand and sing a song with me. You probably know it. There's only... The, the, the Bible says there's one thing we must do to do the work of God. What must we do to do the work of God? They asked Jesus, well, what, what must we do to do the work of God? And he said, the work of God is this, to, hmm, to believe. That's the work. So we're going to sing a little song. And without music, we're going to sing it, what they call acapulco. You know that's not the way it is, but it's good enough. Acapello. We're going to sing it acapello. And here's the song. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. And sing it again. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. Sing it with me. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Close us in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to gather in your name, Lord. Lord, we do thank you for the word, the precious word of our